everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today on another episode of Retail Redeveloped. I am so excited. I am in Soho right now at the headquarters of Beta. I am, uh, I am being joined by David Munzinski, which I just nailed the name. I was, I was really nervous. Um, and we are going to be talking about cutting edge experiential retail we're in the heart of it all. We're in New York City. I've been geeking out, running from, from space to space over the last 24 hours, really trying to immerse myself in, in the cutting edge. And I'm so excited to be joined by a group that is absolutely on the bleeding edge. I just left your Hudson Yards location. That is a place that I could spend way too much money if left to my own devices. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to be here. Thank you, Adam, for having us. So we're, we're going to cover, we're going to nerd out on all things retail. Uh, but before we do that, would you mind just giving people a little bit of background, who you are, talk a little bit about Brickwork, how you got into this business, how a company like Macy's, which is you know one of the, the, the legacy brands of, of retail, thought enough about what you guys were doing to partner with you guys. Just, just let us know kind of how you got to sit in the chair that you're in now. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been with uh, I've been with Beta for almost a year now. Um, I joined the company when they acquired a startup called Brickwork that I had uh, that I had founded, um, and now uh, my current role is to serve as the the president of our Arc platform business. Uh, and our Arc uh, platform is the uh, software and hardware solution that sits underneath. Uh, all of our experiential retail marketplaces. So that is our own beta concept stores, uh, which is, you know, beta stores are, are there are about 25 across the country today. Those are our um, experiential marketplaces for consumer electronics and smart home. Um, that was the store you were just in, in Hudson Yards. That was one of the stores we opened earlier this year. Uh, phenomenally successful in terms of traffic and uh, the value the brands are seeing from engaging with consumers there. Um, we also operate a uh, marketplace in the, uh, the fashion and uh, lifestyle space called Forum. We opened that this fall uh, with one uh, small store uh, on Melrose in Los, Los Angeles. Um, and then our, the same ARC platform sits underneath the market at Macy's, uh, it is the platform uh, that helps to operate the new Toys R Us stores uh, and then other uh, third-party retailers who run marketplaces uh, as well as, you know, in the future, uh, other concepts that we may bring to life within the company. So now when you say the platform, is this just like next generation point of sale data capture, like, like run everybody through, like get nerdy with me a little bit about what, what that platform does and why these companies think it's such a game changer that, that, that they would want to obviously invest real dollars with you guys and help you expand. Right. It's a, it's a great question. And, and there's actually quite a bit to unpack. Um, so, I mean, it starts from, um, the, the, the software and hardware solution, the platform itself, um, really, uh, is meant to enable a new business model in retail that we think is uh, we think is you know one of the front running business models to aid in the sort of transformation of the entire industries through this period of of creative destruction that we're seeing right now in physical retail. So there's a, a lot of opportunity ahead of us, but that business model as we see it is to is we we identified. Uh, pretty early on, that brands today, uh, led by direct-to-consumer brands, really see physical retail as an opportunity to tell a brand story, uh, engage with consumers, and ultimately acquire new consumers in a way that is more efficient uh, from an investment perspective than going out and just, just spending more and more in uh, digital marketing dollars. Because well, you can only spend so much, right? I mean, at, at the end of the day... Uh, but, I, I had a, a great conversation with the guys at uh, Casper, and their budget for kind of those hunter-gatherer kill teams online is staggering. Yes. Like, it's an unbelievable yes. number. And it's amazing how 
you, we retail nerds, we all call it like halo effect or, you know, I mean, obviously there's a lot of different, different ways to, to describe it, but the ability to go in and for, I'm just talking about for me personally to go in, like I'd never tried the Theragun. Right. right. The, uh, I love, I love exercise and I love working out. I'm getting old. So I have to <laughs> have to stretch and do all this crap that I used to not do. Exactly. I would have never spent the 400 bucks on it. Even if they gave me a free trial without being like, Oh wow. Without okay, trying this it. Is, right. This is legit. So right. that, that halo effect has to be one of the huge building blocks of what you guys are doing. It correct? is right. And then, and then for the brands, w- what retail does is we've seen is it, it, um, it, lo- you know, sort of lowers that blended acquisition cost for across your consumer base. And so we really, you know, we really bought into that idea and we said, you know, there has got to be a way to make retail more accessible for more brands in, in a pure model. That meet that really you know from an economic standpoint uh, matches up with the goal the goals of new retail, which is storytelling, engagement, and ultimately ac- new acquisition. So for us, you know that was that has manifest as experiential marketplaces, and that's what we operate. And so there's there's really four elements to you know, modern or new experiential retail as we see it. Uh, and those are, uh, and so we call it, the, I call it the four S's, uh, which is sort of a riff on, you know, the traditional four P's. Um, so uh, I- experiential retail has to include storytelling. So it has to be, a, uh, there has to be a, a way for the brand to tell their story, get their marketing directly in front of the consumer. Um, and I'm, as I go through these four, um, you'll see that what I'm, what I'm trying to set up here is that uh, the software hardware solution, the technology, is built to allow those four things to really come to the forefront of the store experience. Um, and, and so it starts with storytelling. Um, the other thing about experiential retail is uh, it has to be sensory. So for us at Beta, what that means is Every single product is out of the box, on a table, and, and you can touch it, you can feel it, you can demo it, um, you can see if it, if, if, if it works, right? Um, and so that's, uh, that is really important. In other contexts, right, it, it's something totally different. Um, so if you, you know, um, it is the ability in our forum stores to really try things on. Um, and have an immersive experience where the brand can tell the story in the dressing room while you're trying the product on because it's fashion. You got to know if it fits, right? And we can talk about how how we actually did that through the platform. But so that's the second point. The third is um, it has to be experiential retail uh, has to be seamless. Uh, and what we mean by that is it has to be seamless. Uh, the consumer has to be able to seamlessly buy however they want to buy. And that's sort of true. We think that's true of all retail, but in, 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 specifically true of experiential retail today. So we got to make it easy for you to buy in store. So we carry inventory on consignment in all of our marketplaces. Uh, you have, or you have to be able to order from our website. Um, or you ha- we have to make it as easy as possible for you to go to the brand's website um, in the event that you know, we happen to be out of stock or you want a different you know, model that's not consigned to us. And, and, or, and buy from there as well. Um, and then the fourth element is service. So there has to be some level of differentiated service. I received great service when I was in there. I was telling you that before we... Yeah, th- that you were. Yeah, and that's script, great. And that's the script great. that you gave this wonderful girl that, that met me, demoed those incredible speakers. The name was, I forgot them. Oh, Davy L.A. Davy L.A. These speakers freaking jam. Anybody that's listening to this and knows me knows I'm a huge music geek. These things rock. You got to check one of these things out. But she was able to encapsulate your what I, what I perceived as your brand message in a 10 second just sound bite. It was perfect. So the service level, I felt very at home. It was it was it was a great experience. We, should get, we, check we should get her on the on the podcast. <laughs> I, I, I'm an idiot. I don't remember her name, but, but she was lovely. Shout out to to the lovely lady the, the, that that, that uh, said hey to the really tall goofy guy that was geeking out about the speakers. Yeah, and and you know to that point, um, she, she is a beta tester, um, and so you know we've we've actually gotten so far as to brand the 
the uh, you know the title of our associates, um, uh, and that speaks to the commitment and the investment in you know that one to one experience that we're delivering, right? And uh, and so those four elements need to come together. So we identified the, you know what the purpose of of retail in the future was. We really you know honed in on that. We said it's working for brands like Casper, Warby Parker. We want to bring that to the mass of new brands in category-specific ways. We said these are the four elements that need to be there. And then we set about to actually develop uh, a hardware and a software solution to provide that, the, 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 uh, that value uh, both to the brand and to the consumer. So you may have noticed good example, the displays within our, our store that sit next to each of the products. Those displays are the mechanism, they're the form factor for storytelling. They're also the form factor for, um, for service to some extent, because you can call an associate over uh, directly through that display. Um, and, and they are a little bit the form factor for the seamless experience. Because what, what you can actually do is, you, you may have noticed, the brand can run a custom promotion um, and we actually share your email address if you opt in with the brand and they'll provide you with a discount. You can use that discount back on their website, you can use it on our website, or you can use it at our point of sale and store. So that's, a, that's just like an illustrative example of how we're leveraging technology to deliver on the, you know, the four S's, as we call it, of experiential retail. Um, and so it, it's interesting, I mean, to, to go back to your, you, you know, one of the things you said in the beginning, we don't, we actually, we actually, it's not actually just next gen point of sale. It's not just you know a a uh, sort of you know traditional uh, retail uh, task management solution. It's really from the ground up an original um, and and proprietary technology solution for experiential marketplaces. And so, unpack that a little bit more for me. Explain why. Sales as a service, or retail as a service. Re how, however, sure. however you want to, you would categorize what you guys do. Tell me why you guys thought enough about it to build a company around it. Why is it that that is so important? Like, how are you guys able to, you know, take these brands that that you're learning about at the same time I'm learning about reading them, right? And sure. how you package sure. that, and how you're able to make like one plus one equals three, like, like what is it about the retail as a service that, that seems to be catching on or seems to be working? Because you guys aren't the only ones trying to figure this out. I talked to um, you know, this incubator slash experiential model seems to be something that people want right now. Why, why, do, you think, why do you think that's important? Why do you think it's working? Well, I, why do you think people want it to work? Yeah, I mean, I, I think fundamentally it's, it's, it's part of the – the the structure of the um you know of, of the of the whole industry um is why it works so um you know there are there are very well funded brands direct to consumer brands uh, across categories who have the wherewithal from you know the the capital that they have, uh, the scale of their business, the the ability, uh, the result of those two things, the ability to attract talent, to be able to go and open up their own stores, and to do that in a way that is, um, you know, is not a existential risk to their business, right? And so, you know, great example is uh, you mentioned Warby Parker, Casper. Um, you're seeing, you know, you're seeing a, a whole litany of brands do this now. Uh, but we, you know, there are, there is a sea of new brands, you know, in each category below those brands, right? And, and we've looked at, you know, very, we're very focused on categories where there is an explosion in brand, we call it brand demand. There's an explosion in brands that want to be in that category and that are entering that category and there's really strong consumer interest and desire, right? And, and we think that the third factor we looked at is we think that there's an opportunity to improve the shopping experience at retail um, beyond what's available today. So if you look at you know, where we started the company in, in, in 2015, it was, um, you know, our, our co-founders came out of Nest so we looked at, we were very familiar with, the co-founders were very familiar with consumer electronics. 
um, and Smart Home, they looked at how you, you know, there was a whole explosion of brands coming off of Indiegogo, and there were large, you know, very large tech companies trying to get into the hardware space. And, you know, so from all sides, it looked like a growth market. Um, on, t on top of that, you had, you know, you could either buy those products on Amazon or you could buy those products at, you know, in the box, off the shelf at Best Buy, but there wasn't really a place to experience those products. Um, and then there, but there was always huge consumer demand because consumers love uh, consumer electronics and smart home, right? So um, that's why we started there. We opened with one store and it kind of grew from there. Um, I think that you've got this pyramid shape of brands, right? Where there's a ton of new brands across categories at the bottom and they don't have either the capital or the expertise to go and, and sign even some of these more creative leases that we're seeing in the market today, where even a three-year lease or even just you know, a brain damage, just a, a pop-up shop, lease. right, oh. on, on a three-month basis. Well, and most landlords don't even understand pop-up shops. Right. There has to be like an intermediate. Either way, you're looking at a, you know, you're looking at a 25 to 50 page lease document. You've got to get the lawyers for that. So it's still, there are still a lot of structural obstacles to entering retail efficiently. And so we think that the reason retail as a service is so interesting uh, and why we've built our business there is because we can pull all those barriers down and we can make it e as easy as you know, a five-page placement agreement, um, including all the data privacy and protection stuff, um, gets you uh, a plate. You know, gets you a placement in one of our marketplaces, or twenty-five or fifty of our marketplaces, and you can you can be selling um, in as little as two weeks later. Um, and that compared it's, to it's a game changer, right? Compared to wholesale, you know, traditional wholesale or going to retail yourself is, as you said, a game changer. Yeah, I've, I've spoken with a couple of the people that are, that are trying to do similar things. Like I mentioned Mace Rich. They've got, uh, they've got their uh, brand box. And Absolutely. Very, very cool. And, and, it's, and I was talking to their uh, chief digital officer, fascinating conversation, and he, he talked a lot about, I mean, when they're talking to these direct-to-consumer brands, they have no freaking clue like what attorney to even call to figure this out. They know how to make sure. a widget like better than it's be been made before, but they don't, that's what they want to do. They don't want to, they don't want to negotiate with some goofball like me and, and, and have to wade through all that. And to be able to flatten that playing field, uh, the way you guys are doing is, is it's interesting. Right. And what, what we're seeing really is that regardless of where you are on that journey as a brand, in your evolution uh, and, and your, your scaling as a business, there are use cases for retail as a service. So you can be, uh, you can be Google Home, massive hardware business, and see a beta store, uh, and, and, and they're a partner of ours, and see a, beta, a group of beta stores as a place to test your storytelling, messaging, be more immersive, have your products you know, out of the box to be demoable, and gather all that data uh, you know, from how the consumer is interacting and engaging, and use that to inform other channel strategies, all the way down to you can be a product coming off of Indiegogo, and you know you're just coming in because you just want to you want to be able to you know uh, allow people to demo your product out of the box, and you want to beta testers to be able to tell the story of that product and be very successful that way, um, and then you can be someone who's you know figured out how to. Uh, like Burrow figured out how to do retail to some, you know, to, on your own, but you just want to expand more quickly through a retail as a service marketplace. So um, it really, you know, it's really a business model. And just like, you know, if we go back 20 years, lar you know, brands, growth brands and large brands were saying, I'm going to be in traditional wholesale. I'm going to maybe open my own stores and malls. It's not that dissimilar today uh, in that it is a channel strategy that you can choose to use as a brand depending on, in different ways, um, depending on where you are in your evolution. Another aspect that I have repeatedly heard is a, a huge deal for, you know, a, a strategy of brand like what you guys are doing is data. And correct me if I'm wrong or please expound on this, um, these direct-to-consumer brands are so data hungry, 
data focused, right? It's in their DNA as opposed to like a traditional Macy's or like a traditional Nike. It's been around a long time that they aren't used to just absorbing all that data. And I've heard that Beta and, and other companies that are like this are trying to grab that data in, in a same extremely analytical way. Like, okay, this person was in the store for this long. We had seven people that touched your product. Of those seven, one person opted into the email, one person bought it, blah, 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 blah. Uh, is that a strong focus for you guys? Uh, absolutely. Um, so, you know, our, what we're able to do in our stores is um, in, in an aggregate and anonymized way, we're able to provide a, for each of the brands that come into our stores on a placement, we're, e we're able to provide a, uh, you know, the same sort of analytics that they would get from their own site. You know, their, their Shopify site or their Magento site or their, um, uh, you know, their, their e-commerce site. So we're, so we're saying, you know, 100 people came into the store and 20 people, um, you know, uh, came by your placement, uh, you know, and we're kind of building the whole funnel all the way down to uh, a transaction. Who, who's transacted? Who's provided you know personal uh, you know their email address uh, because they've opted in to receive marketing from you as a brand? Um, so we're building a whole conversion funnel, um, and we're showing the brands what that looks like in the, in the physical world in the same way that they are you know they're used to getting that from the digital world, and that's you know that's huge for them because that those are the the mental the mental model that they're used to. Is is digitally native, right? More than uh, you know, I think, and that I think that's more specifically descriptive than direct consumer. These are digitally native brands. They started online. They know how to sell on their Shopify site. They probably know how to sell on Amazon. They've probably started to look at other. You know, they're very sophisticated with different digital marketing channels and performance marketing channels. They get affiliates. They get direct mail. Uh, um, they get uh, email marketing. They get direct. Probably now starting to do even even some offline direct mail uh, with with companies like Pebble Post, right? Um, and they're they they uh, that is their mental model is you know digital first, digitally native, and so when they look at retail, they say, well, what do you you know or wholesale? They like, what do you mean you can't? What do you mean I can't capture data? What do you, what do you mean I you can't I can't retarget this customer who's spent ten minutes with my product, just like I can with a customer that's spent ten minutes on my, you know, product detail page? What do you mean I can't see how people uh, move in an in an anonymous way through the store and where they dwell and how I stack up uh, against? You know, in terms of dwells against my entire category in store, or against other other brands in store, it, that just doesn't make sense to them. And so that's all we're doing is filling in that uh, that uh, uh, yeah the the ability to understand, um, you know, how people are engage how how consumers are engaging and interacting with their products. So what is it about a physical space? Take, take me into the physical space and the design space and, and, and how you guys have figured out a way to make that successful. Because when I, I, I'm trying to think of a way to word this, not make it sound cheesy. It's like you guys took the essence of, of just the one I was just in, right? So sure. it's very tech. The essence of Best Buy, like what it probably was in the founder's head and distilled it way, way, way down into this, what was that, 1,800 square feet? Maybe, yeah. Something like that? <laughs> Sorry, I, I measure stuff with my for a living. Um, and you were able to distill, like, take the very best parts of it. Because I can look at a Dyson air purifier in Best Buy, right? I can look at yes. a, a pair of headphones in Best Buy. But it's like the, the curation aspect was very, very interesting. So walk, walk me through how you guys curate, like, how you guys are like, yes, this product is going to, this makes sense for us to partner with. This... It, super clean lines. I'll, I'll put some pictures up. I took some pictures um, on Instagram, LinkedIn, and, and the show notes and such. Um, walk me through that design and, and, and how you guys kind of perfected that or, or in process of perfecting that. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we, 
it starts from the category focus um, and a acknowledgement of great retail experiences that have come before us in that category. Um, so, you know, people walk into our beta stores all the time and say, wow, this, this, this feels like an Apple store, but the products are so much cooler. Um, or there's just more, there, there's more variety of product here. Um, and that makes us feel good. And that, and, and, you know, it, that's an homage to, I think, you know, many of the same, uh, principles that they really in, invented. So it be the, the store having clean lines, everything being out on a table to, to demo and try, um, and there being, you know, expert service, great lighting, I mean, it's great, all the, great I mean, it's lighting. All the, it's, sure. It's, I mean, you know, stuff, but it's uh, good. even down to the, you know, the, some of the materials we use, you know, um, being somewhat similar, um, you know, and I think, um, you know, for us, that's what, you know, we've looked at, we've looked at, you know, where we've been inspired and the, the types of retailers that we've been inspired by that have great experiences in that category. Um, we're trying to democratize that for more brands. So, you know, there, you know, if you can't get into some of those other retailers, we want you to be able to get into our store. Um, but we do have, there's a, there's a high level of curation and that level of curation is about, you know, do we really think that the, you know, we're starting to build our own, you know, consumer base, and do we do we think your product's going to connect with with our consumers? And um, that is a uh, process that is is managed by our partnerships team, who you know they get you know brands reaching out, they go find new brands, they work with part with other partners to to uh, identify brands, and then they bring them into the store, and we you know we merchandise them, and we do that on a global and a local level, um, and I think that. That, that process also helps us to put the right product in the right place and contextualize it. And, and that's what makes it feel, you know, I think, feel relevant um, and puts, you know, the, the whole goal is to put the brand, uh, those brands, those product makers front and center. So how, what makes a good store? Obviously Hudson Yards is, I mean, the place is rain, snowy, you know, Wednesday afternoon, sure. middle of the day. It was like 2 o'clock, 2.30 or something like that when I was in there. Packed, so obviously Hudson Yards, Middle Manhattan would be a ten. Like, how do you look at other stores? Like, what gets you excited about a location? Is it is it mostly partnership driven through a Macy's or through somebody like that? Or do you, we we mentioned the I'd love for you to touch on the fashion component. Sure. Uh, that we were talking about before we started taping. Like, what gets you guys excited about a new market or a new store? Is there some kind of fabric of a neighborhood that you guys look for? Like, what gets you guys like? Oh, we we got to do a store here. Right. Well, I mean, it really, I mean, if you, as I said, I mean, we're, we're trying to bring a more pure business model to how brands think about uh, retail today. And so really, I mean, if retail is marketing, then we're trying to bring this more pure business model, which means you don't have to uh, sign a 10-year lease, stock a bunch of inventory um, in order to be good at retail. Those are, those are two things that are very expensive, right? And they, um, you know, both today hit, hit your balance sheet. Um, instead, we want to make it more efficient to enter retail um, by just saying, I'm going to make a marketing investment. I'm going to, I'm going to pay for placement in one of these marketplaces. And, and then I'm going to, you know, consign that inventory and I'm going to do that, you know, at a, at a small scale across a whole host of them. And so, um, when, when, when you think about that, um, if it's a, if it's marketing, then what we really have to deliver on is an audience. Uh, we've got to bring traffic and consumers and they, they have to be qualified. And that's what, that's what we look for. We look for, let's put stores, let's put marketplaces where there's a great audience of people that the, these products and these brands in this category are going to resonate with. Um, and do you get into the weeds like uh, Warby Parker would, uh, where you, you work with a few brands, you can kind of geofence or you can get Amex data and, and see all the zip codes and that creates a heat map? Or are you guys just more like, Listen, there's a million people to walk through this mall a day. We should probably put a store here. Is, is it art, science, maybe a little bit of both? It's art and science. 
Well, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but, all right, no secret sauce. We won't, we won't make you give away the secret sauce. Um, would, you, would you touch on, I mean, it wouldn't be a retail podcast. I would lose my podcasting license if I didn't, if I didn't talk about the retail apocalypse, like kind of clickbait term that everybody likes to use. Sure. I liked, and I, so much I wrote it down, the creative destruction in retail. Yeah. I, I think uh, I've heard it, I've heard it termed as a retail reckoning, mm-hmm. right? A lot of the kind of the dinosaurs getting cold. Um, walk me through what you mean by creative destruction and, and what are, you're on the cutting edge. What are you seeing? Do you think it's apocalypse? Do you think it's something completely different? Walk, walk me through that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's a big conversation. There's a lot to unpack. And, and unfortunately, there's nobody else here, man. That, that's Let's, right. Uh, <laughs> we're good. Uh, un- unfortunately, you know, none of the, none of that complexity that, that really sits underneath, um, what's going on with retail right now, uh, makes for easy and attractive like clickbait, right? Right. Clickbait or, you know, sound bites. And so instead what you get is, you know, 10, you know, 1800 stores are closing this year. This many stores right now that makes it. That so I think there I think there's a narrative in the um, in in the, in the popular media that is very very negative right now about what's going on in retail only only showing one side of it um, and I think what, what's interesting is that you know the other side of that is not a retail story it ends up becoming a startup story like the positive side of it is is a startup story it's a tech story it's about how you know, Casper and, and, and you know, Warby again and others are just, you know, away or just like growing like weeds. Um, but that's, that's always positioned more as a startup story rather than, than sort of a retail story, which is unfortunate because I do think those are two sides to the same coin when I characterize it as a period of creative destruction. Now, it goes without saying that uh, there, the, the U.S. was overstored, right? Um, we are... You know, we're we're in the sort of a, a third wave. Uh, we think you know we think retail as a service, experiential, you know, marketplace is in in uh, brick and mortar is sort of a third wave of sort of modern retail evolution. Um, there was there was the mall, which was a you know had a had a was was almost like a platform, um, not quite, but almost like a platform. It it was able to aggregate a lot of consumer demand, um, and into that you could slot you know sort of brand supply through the you know uh, the uh, you know, leasing in the mall and then and then what you could do in, in you know department stores as anchors and then everything moved to to e-commerce um, and e-commerce kind of came in as a second wave and and that you know there was obviously very strong platform plays there uh, you know Amazon chief among them and then and now we're sort of into this third wave and we think that there there will be retail as a service platforms there will be Hopefully, hopefully it'll be us. I mean, that that's our that's our goal and our mission is that we become that platform for this third wave. And as we look at, you know, how this is how how this is evolving, you know, we're still seeing the after effects of that first wave, right? So, you know, the the, the world is now three evolutions of retail or two evolutions of retail beyond that that first phase. If this is, you know, if that, if that makes sense. And, and, but we're still seeing, you know, the fallout in moving past that, right? And so I think you're going to see, I mean, I, I, you know, my, my uh, it's unfortunate, but I really think you're going to see the same, I think you're going to see the same thing at some point, you know, 10 years from now, you'll probably have people saying, well, the U.S. market was over e commerce in, in much the same way. Um, over startup brand. Yeah, and maybe you'll see a move to, you know, um, e-commerce as a service. And I think we're already seeing that in some of the new e-com platforms that are coming out are incredibly turnkey in that they're offering services on top of just a, a tech platform that includes, you know, the check uh, checkout and a, and a product catalog. Would this be like Shopify or...? or? I, I think Shopify is taking note of even younger, newer entrants and starting to add more services, especially as they go you know, up market into Shopify Plus. You see the acquisitions they've made recently are around um, 
you know, creating uh, logistics as a service as part of their offering. So yeah, I think so. And I, and so I think, you know, that, and, and if there's a platform opportunity, people will, will grow in, you know, there are, uh, there are technology companies that'll grow into it. So that's what I think what's happening is it's this, you know, it, it's sort of just this massive cycle that we're in. And I don't think it's ever going to stop. I just think we're going to see new iterations of that cycle. And what that means, unfortunately, I, I think the real story that's worth telling and, and that, you know, I think the media should be thinking, you know, should really be spending time on is how this is playing out between, um, how this is playing out demographically and how it's playing out, um, you know, uh, 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 on, an, on an income basis for consumers uh, at, different, at different income levels. And so what... Explain that. Yeah, yeah. Let, 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 me, let me not just leave that. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, on the edge I, of my seat. Well, you know, you're, so, so A malls, you know, are, are A malls because of where... Ain't going anywhere. Because of yeah. the demographics within a 10, 20, 50 mile radius. That's why they're A malls. Um, and C malls are C malls because, you know, of the purchasing power within a radius of those stores. And, and you're, seeing, you're seeing everyone jump out of sea malls. You're seeing everyone, you know, you're seeing sea malls really struggle. You're see, there's, no, there's no drop off in traffic at A malls. Uh, there's, you know, retailers, if you talk to them, are doing well. They're, there's not the same sort of portfolio rationalization, you know, at that level uh, or, or at that, in that type of mall. And, and then, and so I think there's, you know, we're, there's sort of a, unfortunately, they're, they're starting to become a little bit of, of a tale of, um, a, two, a tale of two economies. Um, and I think that's true. I mean, that, that's just to take down from, you know, I, I think a much larger story in our country right now, but there's sort of a tale of two economies in how retail is rationalizing. Um, and I think we have to be really like thoughtful about that and think about what does that mean? Like, does that limit consumer choice in certain, in certain markets and certain segments of the market? Um, you know, there are some really great retailers who are looking at that uh, looking at, you know, very specific segments of the market and saying, you know, I want to bring a better shopping experience. I want to bring, you know, uh, a better product um, into certain markets and, and are actually expanding or doing really, really well. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's a story worth, worth telling. Well, and I think going back to the C Mall, uh, and we're saying ABC Mall, so A is right in the middle of the best neighborhood in your city, C mall, you're, you know, it's probably two miles away from another mall. It's on the outskirts, you know, it never had the best brand mix, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but I, when I think of the C mall problem, I go back to the disruptor that kind of started all this, the Amazon of the world. I mean, if you just want the next commodity cheapest, you know, no must, no fuss, you're going to go to Amazon, right? You're, you guys aren't competing against Amazon for what you're doing. You guys are a totally different thing. But those C malls, like if I was just going to go get some commodity thing as cheaply as I could, that business is gone. I mean, I know only what ten percent of stuff is bought online, but right, the commodity right. well, cheaper I, next know, I, is I mean, got to be say, way one of, right. I mean, I just kind of went from malls to e-commerce to to sort of retail as a service. But there's you know there's also the story of, of a big box in there as well, and that was a you know that was a sort of different evolution than the mall. But I I would say as much as you're going to go to Amazon, you're just going to go to Walmart, and maybe you're going to go to Target. Um, and I think you, you've seen this year those those two businesses outcompete their peers in the general merchandise space and in the department store space because they're able to Incredible offer how fast they've that value, on. right? And they're able to offer that value in physical retail, right? Um, and then you know there, you see there's this massive explosion in dollar stores, um, and that's a, that's another you know so I that's another area that there's a lot of consumer demand. There's a lot of stuff. I mean, there's 30, oh, like almost 4,000 dollar stores in the country today. So, um, you know, there is a, there is a lot of retail growth across, I guess in summary, there's a lot of retail growth across the whole spectrum. I do think in the, um, in the specialty world and the department store world, it's, it's a very clear story of, mall to e-com to, you know, what the next model is going to be in, and then in the, uh, you know, 
in other areas of the market, um, it's it's a it is a rush, a consumer rush to value, and you see you know, Walmart, dollar stores, Amazon, um, you know, and others t- taking share there as a result. So I've, I've got an analogy that I've, I've used before. I want to get your take on it. Um, I've compared big retail, both from a landlord perspective, so your Simon, GGP, uh, CBL of the world, sure. and the large legacy retailers, let's just say Macy's, Lord & Taylor, whatever, whatever big kind of traditional established retailers, I, I look at them a little bit in the same way as I look at the record companies, because I told you I'm a music geek, right? Sure. Before, I mean, they ran the freaking show, man. Like, just there was just, how much is a CD? Whatever, right. yep, I'm, I'm, I'm in. Sure. Right, here's my 20 bucks. And then you had Napster come along and completely change the game. And now, you know, my, my kid will probably, you know, think it was hilarious that I used to have a book full of CDs. Right. Um, and... I look at retailers, legacy retailers, the same way. Like they've seen, you know, the the pale white horse coming for them, right? They're like, oh my god! Like if we don't figure this out soon, we're done. Is is it has it surprised you that these retailers are trying to think outside of the box as quickly as they have, and and using? you guys or do you think it's taken them forever and they're behind the eight ball um what do you how, how do you think about just the the sea change that's going on and 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 how these retailers and, and landlords are kind of reacting to it sure i um rather than i guess what i'll what i'll say is i i think uh let's rather than you know just kind of give you my opinion i'll say let's look at them let's look at the let's look at the market and, and the market sentiment. Um, and I think the market sentiment is they're not reacting fast enough. If you look at the, the way um, you know, the market, you know, m- most of their stocks have trended o- o- over the past several years. Um, so I think that we'll just take that as consensus maybe, right? And say, okay, so they're, they're not, you know, as a result of that, if you believe that they're, they're not reacting fast enough. And I think that's, um, so, then the question is, uh, you know, what what does that future look like? Is there? I guess the question is, is that is there an, a- an apt analogy in the music world? Because you know, in fact, in music, we're actually now on the other side, where you know, now that there is a, a there is a new sort of dominant, shout out to Spotify. Love yeah, to Spotify. right. There's a new dominant business model that allows them to you know both the artist and the and the label to make and the publisher to make money, right? And um, and I think that's what everyone's looking for is what is that business model? Is it, is it leasing, you know, for the department stores? Is it operate, you know, there's very, very successful international department stores that generally operate on concession and lease model. Um, can that model be more, uh, more broadly applied in the U S and is that enough? I mean, I think, you know, to some extent it's, you got to break it down as a, you know, the, the, there, there's a a business model. There's a channel. There's a there's a business model lens. There's a channel lens, and then there's sort of an audience lens. And you know, unfortunately for re, you know, one of the things to the benefit of the music industry is that you know the audience never really went away. It's not like people said, okay, I'm not going to listen to music anymore because I've got I've got streaming streaming you know video now because of Netflix. Like I'm not listening to music anymore. I'm just watching right. That, that, that hasn't really happened. Um, within retail, though, people have said, you know, I'm not going to shop, you know, I'm not shopping, I'm not transacting in stores as often because I can transact online now. And, you know, without owning sort of online as a channel, that leaves you vulnerable as a, you know, maybe as a, as a department store to, um, you know, to being disrupted. So I've got a bunch of questions here, and I've gotten to zero of them. Okay. Right. So so we're, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you with a couple kind of quick quick questions. Um, you guys have have said you go great lengths to remove the idea of your visit being only about buying a product. Like walk walk me through because it's so counterintuitive to to you know the old guard retail model. Sure. And it. Quick summary: Why why is that something you guys focus on or don't focus on? 
Well, w- we really think that the transaction is, you know, in a, in a world where the consumer expects to buy where they want to buy at the moment they want to buy, the, the transaction can be divorced from the experience of discovering and engaging with the product. Um, and so we're, you know, we're really focused on discovery and we're focused on that engagement, that demo. And if you want to go buy back on the brand's website or you want to come back and, and purchase on our website after you've thought about it or, you know, after you've seen some other, you know, the, the brand has targeted you to kind of jump back in with them, then we're, we're fine with that. So how surprised were you that Macy's took such a big interest and in financial interest, obviously, were you surprised that they were the ones that were like, oh, we got to get on board with this? Because I, when I think Macy's, I think Heritage, I think, you know, certainly some things they've done well in the past, but I, I wouldn't historically think cutting edge, like, oh my God, they're, they're, they're changing the game. Did that surprise you? And, and how is that relationship kind of blossoming? Yeah, I, I think it didn't surprise us because they're, they're, they're very earnestly uh, working to evolve their not only their business model but the perception you know that's that started to be uh, you know generated in in the market right um, you know I mean I think the I think the consumer you know consumer sentiment is influenced by the business press right it's, uh, it, it just is today and so yeah I mean the more negative news that comes out about you know, their business model and how under siege it is and all these other stores closing in the mall around them, the more the consumer says, wait, maybe that's not where I can get, you know, that new thing I want. And, and the maybe more these not, guys are forced yeah, maybe, to really think Maybe I'd rather shop somewhere else, right? So I think they're very aware of that and there's there's an earnestness to evolve. And as a result, we were not surprised that they wanted to, uh, you know, try a new business model and bring that into their stores and attempt that. Um, just like, the, you know, as they talk about in their... Um, you know, in, in to the business press, they're they're trying to do other things like grow their lease business and they're you know, aggressively growing their online business. Um, and I think it also wasn't surprising when you look at how well they actually moved into e-commerce. Uh, they've got a multi multi billion dollar business in e-commerce, which is which is more than um, you know that, than you might expect, right? I mean, I just think the the. The counter to that is that you know everything looks small compared to what Amazon does online. Yeah, so. that's, that's for sure. <laughs> so you guys recently opened a fashion-based store called Forum. Give me the quick version of what I should expect when I go to Melrose and visit Forum, and maybe you know one other uh, thing that you guys want to focus on that you think your specific model could be just yeah, kick-ass for. Sure. Um, so we we we. We chose to open a forum, which is focused on uh, fashion and lifestyle brands. Um, there's a there in uh, on Melrose in LA because Melrose is sort of ground zero today for um, retail innovation. Um, for for whatever reason, um, you know, it's a, it's a it is a street that's, that has attracted, you know, very innovative concepts from Nordstrom and Nike and Glossier and we felt, and others, and we felt like we wanted to be in that mix um, and, uh, and that we would, we would be able to tell a story to that customer authentically and allow those brands to come in um, in, in our model and, and meet that customer. And what we found is there's actually qu- quite a few um, sustainable brands that jumped on really early. So there's sort of a there's sort of a sustainability story, uh, which is a huge trend in in apparel today. It needs to be a huge trend in apparel. Yeah, I went to the new Everlane store down it, the street. There you go. And it was as much about the process and the transparency as exactly. it was about the clothes. Exactly. It's crazy. Um, and I think you'll only see that increase. And so we're we're really excited that those brands chose us to kind of enter enter retail, many of them for the first time or, or very early in their evolution. Um, I think what we're so I think we'll you'll see that you'll see us grow that concept over time, um, and we'll do that uh, on our own with new stores. We might do that with other partners, um, but you know it's very early days since we just opened that in October, and we're we're just trying to learn as much as we can before we um, before we take the next step. Who else is impressing you 
uh, obviously you guys are doing your own thing, but, but what other brands, and that can be, you know, a, a specific brand or that could be a store. Who else is out there that you're like, man, those guys, there's some smart guys in that room. They're, they're really impressing me right now. What are, what are some other brands that, that have your eye? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think in, in, um, in the, in the retail space, we look at, um, you know, we always look at Nike as just being, um, so next level, so next level and how, how they think about, it's you know, crazy. engaging the customer, um, and how they think about, you know, delivering on, you know, all those four S's, like making it super sensory, telling authentic stories from, you know, from their athletes, um, and two athletes, um, and, you know, the, so without a doubt, um, without a doubt, Nike, um, you know, I think there's, there's a number of retail as a service, um, companies that are, that are coming up and we we're very encouraged by that. Like the more of us there are, um, the, these are onto something, the, yeah, right. Yeah. The more that brands, ha, you know, generate an awareness that this is a well, business the more model the consumer, like, and know, the more that the consumer, the consumer you know, get, starts get to be on. trained to say, okay, this is a, this is a multi-brand marketplace. I know how to shop this. I get this. I know I don't have to buy here. I can go back on the site. So, you know, I think that's great. And, and there, there's, there's plenty of those. And, and the nice thing is that, you know, New York seems to be the hotbed right now. Um, whether it's now, you know, neighborhood goods or show fields naked. I mean, we're, we're all sort of right here and we're, we're all, you know, trying to make it work in New York. As a, as a retail nerd, it's so exciting to be up here and just see the cutting edge. Like I, I've literally just been geeking out for the last 24 hours. and I'm about to go do it some more. Uh, it, it's, it really is incredible. But David, you've been more, more, more than, than, uh, generous with your time. I just want to take a second and acknowledge you for that. Uh, I think that you've shared some incredible stuff. Uh, you've taken time out of your busy day to um, to talk to us and educate us for uh, for what you guys are doing. Uh, I know it meant a lot to me. I'm sure it means a lot to uh, you know some other retail nerds out there that listen to this. And I just want to take a second and say thank you. Adam, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate you having Beta um, allowing me to come on and and. Geek, geek out on this model. The you know, I think no one really has the whole sort of what's gonna you know the 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 what the what's next what's next for retail and this whole you know create this creative destruction that we're going through. I don't think anyone has it figured out. Um, we're trying to play a part in you know bringing brands to consumers and doing it in in a way that's authentic and allows the brands to be front and center and hopefully. That's enough to you know connect with the consumer. And how can people um, that that don't live in New York City or or LA? How can people find out more about Beta? How they how can they connect with you? How can they connect with the brand? Like how what should people look up on your social channels? Anything? Yeah. So you can always go to uh, Beta.com if you're a consumer or a brand. You can you can you can shop there as a consumer. You can you know get in touch with the team to to uh, get placement in one of our stores as a brand. Um, and, and then you can go to arc.com, ARK.com. If you're a retailer uh, or a landlord or a REIT and you want to learn more about how to partner with us on a platform level um, to bring that technology into your, your stores, um, I'm uh, David at BATA.com. And I am more than happy to introduce you to the right person inside of our growing company to you know, further your, your goals, whether you're a brand, retailer, or consumer. That's what we got. That's all we got for Retail Redeveloped. My name is Adam Williams. David, thank you once more you. Uh, from, from everybody that, that listens to this.